My name is Andres Hake and I'm the Dean here at GSAP. I want to say basically how grateful we are to everyone here that uh, it's participating in this session. The first one that uh, we started last week actually was looking at the, uh, something very specific. Uh, what is that, what is the status that we can, what is the work that images and projections are doing for architecture, for planning, for preservation, for the disciplines of the built environment? We are producing renderings, we're producing master plans, we're producing images that look kind of futuristic or alternative or recompositions of what exists, but still we're often not interrogating what is the work they do, how they operate, how they associate with other things. Uh, and the, the discussion that we have last week actually was helping us to understand what is the way that we mobilize the jet to come. Today's session is addressing a question that is equally important and unavoidable for us. And we're affirming what it could be. Basically, what, is, what, what does it mean to operate from an ecological paradigm? And that's something that, of course, is not uh, an accident. It's a fundamental question that our disciplines are looking at and they're part of unavoidable because it's the time that we're living also, but also because the, the idea of how things connect to each other, each, each other and how reality is produced in the participation of many different actors that are uh, uh, forging alliances, uh, being part of disputes, uh, uh, confronting each other, but also part for, uh, uh, finding ways to, to produce something collectively. It's a fundamental question of the time we're living in that of and definitely uh, an, a notion that the, our disciplines cannot avoid. Uh, so in a way, I think that these affirmation sessions are accumulative. We're accumulating questions that relate to each other and we're building a way to address them together uh, from different inputs, different trajectories, different traditions and sensitivities being uh, collaborating on this. I think it's very important also to say that there's uh, ways in which practice, architectural practice in this case, is reacting to these questions and that is already registering a, uh, a body of experimentation that we can look at and collectively and evaluate. And I'm very happy that we have today Mireya Lutharaga, uh, uh, one of the founders of, of TAG with Alex Muñoz and also uh, Fuminori, Fuminori uh, Nusaku and, and Mio uh, uh, Suneyama that have also been uh, as Mireya teaching at GSAP uh, and uh, I, I think your practices are incredibly uh, relevant in this discussion and actually it's quite uh, uh, relevant to see also how you're engaging with cities like, like Barcelona and Tokyo that have are the paradigms of maybe thinking of the connection of architecture and entities that operate at a larger scale uh, and you re reviewing what those traditions are in, in basically facing uh, issues like climate crisis and unavoidable, unavoidably their ecological dimension, how to address them uh, uh, to ecology, as, as Albena Geneva would say. I think it's also very relevant that we have Albena Geneva and Jorge Teropailos here uh, as a part of this conversation. Albena has been uh, crucial in connecting architect and understanding how many of the, of the challenges that architecture planning our preservation are, uh, and, and all the disciplines that are dealing with the built environment are how the challenges that they're facing are very much questions that have been also addressed in the tradition of the SDS. And what is the way that the SDS has not only been influential in architecture, but also what have been the contribution of architect designers and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, uh, neighboring, I would say, and friends uh, disciplines uh, in, in contributing to the, to the SDS. And Jorge Otero, of course, uh, it's also in the middle of, or kind of central to this discussion, uh, his work on uh, basically how climate also is challenging the notions of history and preservation, and what is the way that experimentation that was one of the, and laboratorization that was one of the origins of the SDS traditions also are part of this discussion is, is uh, 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 it's a, it's a fundamental, uh, I would say, uh, 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 voice in, in these discussions for it that uh, will, and, and your presence here also as a uh, full-time faculty of GSAP is also incredibly important to understand how GSAP is part of also these, these conversations. I want to say also that uh, affirmation is a very uh, loaded term that we wanted to embrace, and Bart will say more about this probably, but for us it's crucial to say that whatever approach to critical uh, uh, reconstruction of the reality we're part of also contains forms of affirmation. We're basically 
uh, seeing how, what is the collapse and cracking of many systems that brought us to crisis like the climate crisis that we're facing now. But by doing that, many things are growing in the cracks. There's many other forms to, to understand how we operate collectively that are becoming very important and relevant. And what we're doing here is also affirming what these practices are, what these notions are, what these ways to think collectively and to act collectively uh, uh, depend on and are consist on. And I think this is uh, 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 very relevant. In a way, we have the responsibility also to claim in what is that that we're doing and how different it is from other forms of practice and, and, and other forms of knowledge. Uh, but of course, it's the conversation in the making. It's not something that is fixed. The notion of affirmation not necessarily needs to be about uh, uh, consolidating the knowledge that can be fixed, but rather to find ways to experiment collectively and having a, a, a notion of togetherness that, that allows for these conversations to happen uh, uh, in connection with the reality or as the reality or as reality, being reality. Uh, and the last thing is that I want to say that two more things that are a little bit more what we're doing here. Uh, we are we have adjusted the uh, Barjan and I the and in conversation with many others the format and in collaboration with everyone here. Uh, it will be a little faster, so you'll see a little bit more of a, a push for for the, the the speed. But that's basically to make sure that we have time for everyone to 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 intervene. And the second thing is what this room is. This room is, feels very isolated, uh, but I think that the notion of what the conversation is now needs to be something different. It's not really just about isolating people in a room and having a conversation that would benefit from this isolation, but rather thinking how we reconstruct the medium in which we operate as one that is interrogating itself. So as part of that, like the idea that we are part of a larger uh, let's say community of people and not people, but human and not hu non-humans, uh, and that the role of a place like TSAB is not that much to isolate and gain a privileged position to discuss, but rather to contribute to render that whole ecosystem more critically and mobilize it uh, or contribute to its mobilization as an interrogating community and a community that can experiment alternative versions of itself is what probably we can do at TSAB. And that's why this room is expanded into a network of co a cohort, a planetary cohort of people from all around the world, most more or less, uh, that is participating. I, I want to say hi to everyone that is contributing to this conversation in the distance. And with that, I want to pass it to Barjan and op uh, to open this uh, second affirmation series or session. So Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm, I'm sorry about the rain. It seems to be that so far every affirmation it, it rains. Um, but welcome to, to our second affirmation, which we provocatively call uh, Material Ecology. Uh, my name is Bart Jan Polman, uh, Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs here at GSEP. Um, and I also wanted to welcome uh, back all of you who joined us last week. Um, I don't think we were lying uh, when we said this project sort of aims to be planetary uh, we had people tune in live remotely from no less than 55 countries um, across all continents and despite uh, the different time zones um, and i also want to mention something else which andres already touched upon is that affirmations um, aspires to radically question um, not only um, prevalent ideas about the built environment but also existing formats and it is for that reason that all of us are sitting here on the stage, um, the presenters, the respondents, and myself, with this moderator, and channeling uh, the questions from the planetary cohort. This is a long way to say that this is not a lecture or two lectures uh, followed by a panel. Um, Affirmations really wants to be a planetary conversation. So the presentations will be brief, 25 minutes each. Uh, we'll start with uh, Huminori and Mio, and then we'll go to Mireya, uh, and then we'll have a response first by Albena Yaneva, um, and then Jorge Otero Pilos before we open it up to you, the audience here, um, as well as the planetary cohort. And we will end around 8.15, 8.20 uh, New York time. So I'm incredibly excited uh, to welcome back Huminori, Mio, and Mireya to, to the school and to have Albena and Jorge join us uh, to serve us with the initial response to their uh, work. And to somehow grasp this work, uh, to, to, to grasp what this work, at least in our opinion, um, is about, 
I want to start with an observation that the Aria architect um, Uriel Voguet um, made this summer in response to Huminori and Mio's work. Uh, and that sort of struck with me ever since. And, and this observation was as to how the notion of details in, in their work, and I'm talking of course about architectural details, um, how details operate as ecological contracts. So details as ecological contracts. And perhaps indeed we can uh, uh, situate both uh, TAC and the work of Huminori and Mio uh, precisely within such an interface. An interface which certainly operates across many different scales and in which details renegotiate question, realign, resist, and dare I say, affirm um, the ecologies and ecosystems that these architectures are part of. Um, and something else I also want to mention is that, um, as, as, as a lot of you know already, is that we ask the, the speakers to share a reading in advance, which we then distribute uh, to the planetary cohort. Um, and it's worth noting that Mireya in particular, but also to a certain extent Huminori and Mio, submitted a text that might well be described as a manifesto um, now and we can certainly critically interrogate the genre of the manifesto and in you know it's particularly its lineage um, as a product of modernity and its claims to authority but nevertheless it also speaks to the the urgency of their work in the, the face of the manatory many um, planetary crisis and urgencies that affirmations want to address and and specifically the very need to act um, so these texts are for, I, I want to propose, they're not so much manifestos as affirmations touching on, you know, what emerges from the cracks that, that Andres mentioned earlier. Um, so as I said, we'll begin tonight's conversation with Huminori and Mio of, of um, uh, Huminori Nutaku Architects and uh, Studio uh, M&M based in, in Tokyo. Um, Huminori is currently teaching at uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan University and established this architectural firm in 2010. Um, he received a doctorate in engineering in 2012 from the Tokyo Institute of Technology, where he subsequently taught. And his works were exhibited at the Japanese Pavilion in the 15th uh, Venice Architectural Biennial and many other places. Uh, Mio Tsunayama began her study of architecture at the Tokyo University of Science and completed it at the EPFL in Lausanne, where she was also a visiting professor this past year. Um, she started her own practice studio M&M &M, uh, in 2012. Mio also teaches at Tokyo University of Science, uh, as well as several private universities in Japan. And Huminori and Mio's talk will be followed by Miraya Luzaraga of TAC, um, which is an architecture and design studio based in Barcelona, founded by Miraya and Alexander Muño. Their projects investigate how architecture can catalyze the development of more democratic lives through the incorporation of feminist thought, ecology, and politics into spatial practice. Their work has received widespread recognition, belongs to the permanent collection of the FRAC, and has been exhibited in numerous exhibitions, triannuals, and biannuals across the planet, and is widely published. And Mariaya is, is a professor at IAC La Salle and the Dean's Visiting Assistant Professor here at Columbia GSEP. Uh, after their presentations, uh, we will first have a question and uh, response from Albena Yaneva and Jorge Otero Pailos. Um, Albena is a professor of architectural theory and director of the Manchester Architude, uh, Architecture Research Group at Manchester Urban Institute. She holds a PhD from the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Mines in Paris and has been a visiting professor at Princeton School of Architecture, Parsons, the New Schools, and Politecnico di Torino, the author of seven, right, seven monographs. Um, Albena's research is intrinsically transdisciplinary uh, and crosses the boundaries of science studies, cognitive anthropology, architectural theory, and political philosophy. Uh, Jorge Otero Pailos is a professor and the director of historic preservation uh, Historic Preservation Program here at uh, Columbia GSEP, as well as an architect, artist, and theorist specializing in experimental forms of preservation. He studied architecture at Cornell University and earned a doctorate in architecture at MIT and is the founder and editor of the journal Future uh, Anterior. And I also want to take this as a moment to, to plug the Fitch Colloquium, which Jorge is organizing and which will happen this coming Friday just across the street at the Italian Academy um, on Amsterdam Avenue. Um, and I briefly want to thank also Erisa Nakamura and Shannon Worley, uh, who are helping us with uh, facilitating the audience questions tonight, and to Clarissa uh, Clarissa Figueredo, um, who is manning the affirmation station in the back and is curating the questions from our planetary cohort. So with that, I think we're ready to start, but not before saying let's get s ready for an evening in which we may or may not discuss ecological or uh, and romantic crossovers, mongrels, ecological thinking, the notion of weak autonomy, uh, Zoom humans, 
cohabitation domes, love aviaries, multi-sited mentalities, post-anthropocentric architecture, expired cities, bricolage, and simply beautiful work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi, I'm Mio Tsuneyama. I'm Humi Nori. Um, thank you for this great um, yeah, opportunity to exchange our thought and work with great, um, yeah, um, yeah, great um, colleagues. Um, yeah. Today we present uh, about urban funk's architecture in a complex mesh. So buildings are made of networks of various materials, from raw materials to disp disposal. Human skills and the knowledge are its important actors, as well as the work of microorganisms in the soil. This network forms a mesh with buildings as temporary nodes. We view the architecture as the complex mesh. Just like a mushroom with its head above the ground has a spread network of mycelium, its main body. However, industrial, uh, industrialization black box the network of materials. Architect can uh, open up the bo black boxes, break down the barriers of institutions and the com conventions, enable the grid of forced alignment and thereby reconnect the network into ecology of multiple species. There, this creates habitat of mul mul multiple species where human and non-human entangle. In, concern, in center of Tokyo, where significant capital investment are made, new goods of and services, secure infrastructures, and clean space are consistently maintained. Com conversely, the urban part periphery is home to a dense population living in detached houses and small apartments. The deteriorating economic situation and an aging population have left this area looking worn and decaying. It's as a sort of brand new cities and expired cities coexist. Due to energy and the uh, food shortage resulting from the war in East Ukraine, rapidly rising commodity prices and the economic strain caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. More and more capital is being concentrated in certain areas of the world city, while others are being neglected. In expired cities, there is insufficient economic capacity to keep building um, and infrastructure updated, yet life persists. In expired city, life continues without replacement of infrastructure and the services. Their waste is converted into resources and used to make small updates. The process of recycling be being, for example, from unoccupied buildings, old shop front and or neglected gardens. Or our architecture approaches begin with resourcefulness. We aim to create livable spaces using what was once considered waste, decaying vacant houses, solar energy and the soil microorganisms. It is like how fungi grows on expired food as nutrients. Holding the house is our home and office. And the original forced solid steel structure was 30 years old when we bought it. We moved in our ma um, after making holes in each floor and um, dismantle interiors. And we are reno renovating it step wisely while living in. The house is located in Nishioi, where it only takes five minutes to the center by train, but not, ha not, not has been de redeveloped due to the complex topography on the edge of, the, of a plateau. Shinkansen and the local trains that cross the area generate loud noises. 
The area is main mainly residential, but since it is Nikon's hometown, small factory used to be settled, which now tends to be reconstructed into housing without lack of green space. Therefore, Nishioi is cheapest land in Shinagawa Ward in Tokyo. <laughs> So uh, first we moved in, we demolished the window. So we, uh, we, we live in there like for one, one year without windows. And after a set, like kind of having windows, like we appreciate it a lot. So the way we renovate it, we really like feel in our bodies, like what changes uh, throughout with uh, the, the work in this building. The holes uh, made it in each floor brings the light from the top uh, top light and also bring up the heat uh, uh, heated air. Also, like connecting kind of views throughout the hall. And we moved in in this situation. All the cable are hanging <laughs> on. Also, like a walk rules to prevent the fire uh, for the steel structure was exposed. And there was no insulation on the wall, also the windows. Also the floor we didn't have on the ground floor. So we started to renovate this by like, coating the rock wall with like the cheapest painting uh, we can find in DIY shop and also like uh, the um, we insulated the walls and the floors to make it more comfortable for us. And we also kind of felt the coldness through this bay window. So we, um, we insulated with the uh, polycarbonate uh, materials. And the also, like uh, using the energy around us can kind of deconstruct our kitchen. So, cooking on the stove, uh, on the pellet stove, also cooking on the rooftop with solar cooking, and finding the uh, materials uh, throughout the um, waste in the city, which is uh, this one is kind of using like. Uh, um, second-hand materials after demolishing this exhibition one-to-one -one model of Seike Kiyoshi into our office. So like our office is very woody, which we didn't expect. And also meanwhile, we got to kind of know the power of the soil and the soil uh, environment is very important for the, um, for the earth. Uh, so we wanted to try to kind of have a so soil in our garden. So we started to break down the concrete on, in our small parking plot one by kind of um, with one, two, like every day, two hours, two, like three hours, uh, three months. And we also brought this, uh, it's very loud. So we brought this, um, crush the concrete debris to the um, disposal site and which makes us like uh, to kind of understand how much we produce the um, construction waste and we try to um, regenerate the soil having the uh, humus and the uh, bamboo charcoal without any um, yeah, chemical materials. And this soil was covered 30 years, um, which was kind of all the uh, microorganism inside was very dead. And we planted um, nursery trees and also like uh, brought some earthworms. And we bring started to bring back our food waste every day. And afterwards, like after two months, like all the weeds came and started the mycelium started to grow and a, a year after it became like full of weeds and all the season changes a lot and we somehow like uh, um, impressed a lot by the power of the soil and also like if we have a soil on our garden we started to 
have a also a cycle of the food. So tomato grows from the um, compost, and also we started to have a kind of a roof rooftop garden and drying the food on the on the rooftop. And then expanding uh, this idea is like uh, having a really small uh, surface of the soil would, uh, had would produce a lot of things. Also, like uh, bring uh, the heat down uh, because of the evaporation. And all, uh, so, if we make um, a small street which does which doesn't have a lot of traffic, we can cre we create the um, soil. Uh, LA. So the next, uh, our next vision is having the soil, uh, convincing neighbor to have the soil street. <laughs> so throughout uh, this experience, we started to like understand like the materiality which goes back to soil is very important. So now we are using a more um, unpetrol, uh, petrol-based materials, also biodegradable uh, materials, which is like a wood fiber or um, cotton uh, on. so now like the interior is covered with full of biodegradable materials which you can see the difference <laughs> between the before and now and now we have also kind of child <coughs> security for the holes which is also with uh, cotton material so this uh, accumulation of the small project forms this architecture. There is no completion in this house. The holes are physical devices for better quality of space, space and life, but at the same time, it is a metaphor of punching the holes to the current housing industry whose demise of selling brand new completed houses and their value goes down quickly by time. Our innovation is still going on. We take confidence resources such as people, energy, and the ways to which we can find around us into the design. So the phenomena of top-down enforcement of policies and institutions to address environmental issues is referred to as political ecology. On the other hand, our concept of uh, wider ecology adopts a bricolage approach, making the best, of best use of available resources. It is a practice rooted in our living spaces, rather than in wilderness or orientalism. Urban wider ecology uh, focuses on the uh, disconnected parts rather than the transcendent whole, like deep ecology. It uh, acknowledges that depth is found in localized elements rather than in frameworks that encompasses the uh, entire planet. Uh, we will approach architecture through a series of small-scale realizations. Through the uh, practice at Hose in the House, we learn the importance of the soil environment. Soil is the basis of life. However, it has been uh, regarded as a nuisance to architecture and the city. We began to seek architecture that coexists with soil. Traditional living environments consisted of houses with independent foundations and dry stone masonry uh, retaining walls, allowing rainwater to percolate into the soil and co coexist with the subsoil environment today uh, environment today however most urban spaces are covered with concrete and asphalt and rainwater is drained into communal ditches microorganisms are acidified and the soil is an unhealthy state for example, when looking at the foundation of wooden houses, the stone foundation was replaced by a concrete continuous footing and uh, by a solid slab foundation with improved moisture proofing and earthquake resistance. 
Carbonized pine piles are placed under the stone foundation to prevent sub subsistence. In healthy soil that is permeable to fresh air and water, mycelia entangle the porous surface of the piles, and the mycelia bind the soil to piles. In Akeno Ray's floor house, we uh, adapted an in, um, independent foundation so as not to disturb the mycelium and water veins in the soil. So Akeno Ray's floor house is located in Yamanashi, Mount Fuji to the south side. So instead of concrete foundation, we propose an independent foundation made of recyclable steel plates. The steel plates foundation opens up the ground surface, allowing air and water to penetrate in the soil. A high floor will keep the foundation dry. Even if there is tummy damage, it can be inspected immediately. We use wheat straw for the wall insulation material. It's biodegradable materials. About 20 people with an um, instructor did straw piling and mud wall painting. So this is the living and dining room. On the left, on the left is a wall of straw and earth. A pellet stove has been installed, and the straw and earthen wall store heat. The shoji screens and traditional Japanese architecture elements are also biodegradable materials made of wood and paper. We use these shoji screens instead of chemical fabric curtains. So this is a detailed section. The wooden structure is placed on the independent foundation. The roof drops down to the south to maximize the sun's energy. The uh, insulation is made of organic materials such as straw and wood fiber. So next, uh, we show a small project in Tokyo uh, called Piles and Pointed Roof. The idea was to allow the soil and the building to coexist in a high density urban environment. A forest and we turn all the ground on the side to soil. A trench is dug where rain falls from the roof, and bamboo is then placed in the ground. By pressing uh, dried leaves, branches, bamboo, charcoal, and stones in, in the trenches, rainwater can easily permeate into the ground. The base Beam timbers are supported by eight steel pi piles. Uh, they have screw uh, at, at the end, which can be uh, reversed to allow them to pull out during a demolition in the future. This pre uh, prevents the piles from remaining in the soil, which has become a problem in recent years in Tokyo. Uh, because uh, of high density of cities, small soil surface accumulation can play a major role in improving urban soils. Next project is house on uh, classical element. It is an off-grid house that uses traditional Japanese construction method, uh, requires less energy has a long life and uses materials that return to the soil. The conventional wooden construction method is based on traditional carpentry techniques but has been modified by modern technology to be more resistant to earthquakes and fires and to enable mass production. Conventional construction methods use small section materials uh, machine dried timbers and metal joints. They do not last long and are rebuilt 
uh, after one generation. On the other hand, traditional construction methods have large sections of members and allow for moving without metal joint and braces. If air drying wood and bra uh, bracing material are used, it can last for more than a hundred years. Uh, since the traditional construction method does not use metal hardware, the upper and lower wooden beams are joined together in this way. Independent foundation can reduce the amount of concrete used by uh, 50% uh, compared to a typical concrete slab. The foundation is shaped to reduce amount of concrete and the, the footprint in contact with the soil. A recent uh, highly insulated and airtight houses use many chemical products such as vinyl and plastic, which do not absorb moisture. These houses are uh, constructed with cedar wood, cellulose fiber, uh, made from recycled paper, and other materials that absorb moisture. It can breathe. The cedar rust boards and plaster are used for the walls. Uh, no glue, uh, glued uh, plywood is used. The walls absorb moisture when it is humid and release moisture when it's dry. This is a breathing wall. In a normal energy efficient house, energy consumption during operation can be reduced, but a, a lot of CO2 is used during product production and disposal. Therefore, we can reduce energy consumption during production and disposal, while realizing energy saving during operation. So this is a picture. The carpenters, the Clients held a celebration when the structure was completed. So this detailed cross-section drawing shows inter integration of foundation that are uh, considered microorganisms in the soil and water veins, a roof for the sun's energy, wood production process, and traditional construction methods. In this way, architecture is created uh, why considering the various actors in the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Now we'll have Mireya. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Bart and Andres, for the invitation. Uh, thank you also for the s dedication and efforts that you are putting on this uh, uh, new format. And uh, we are very honored to be here, uh, surrounded by, by everybody. So, um, yeah, what we will do tonight is to, in a very short uh, uh, presentation, to uh, go, th go through some of the um, uh, aspects, key aspects that we have been working in the office for the last uh, years uh, through the super quick explanation of uh, uh, some of the projects that we have been developing in the office. Okay. Um, yeah, this was a, a little bit like uh, the first slide that I wanted to share with some other works that we have been following up. Okay, first project that I would like to show is ARCA. Um, in ARCA, we wanted to investigate new models of uh, production of green spaces within the city of Barcelona. Uh, cities usually choose the species that, the, the, the plant species that live with us in the cities um, uh, based on uh, mainly ornamental and uh, functional criteria causing like that uh, an homogenization of the urban landscape uh, together with a fragility of the ecosystems that live without in the, with us in the cities. Uh, our proposal was to build this portable garden that would develop a more complex vision of the possibilities of incorporating nature in the contemporary city beyond the aesthetic criteria. So um, together with um, some uh, 
uh, biologists, experts in landscape and uh, botanicals. Uh, we did this careful selection of plant species and we explored like that in this garden uh, the incorporation of edible species uh, in order to open the discussions on uh, food sovereignty in the urban context or spe species that are capable of absorbing 10 times uh, more CO2 than uh, usual or even species that are capable of um, gathering a, a larger number of pollinating agents. So as if it was a procession and it was a movie, but, but it's not working, but it was fun. Uh, the garden could move both mechanically or through human means, which was uh, more fun. Uh, exploring the capacity for collect collective gathering uh, around the artifact. So um, the, the installation, this typology of garden could travel uh, through the cities of Barcelona. Um, uh, for example, to places where there is a lack of green uh, areas or places where there is a higher concentration of pollutants or uh, even to be turned as a classroom uh, for the knowledge of, of, uh, of botanical species, interspecies botanical knowledge in the schools of the city center. Uh, so as you can see, our projects have often this uh, speculative nature, uh, so thinking uh, with the uh, material and political possibilities of the present, we try to envision uh, alternative scenarios for the future. Um, this other project, uh, which uh, we called the Garden for Romantic Crossovers, uh, we started from the analysis of different uses that usually occur in the public space in Madrid, uh, in this case often related to natural spaces, uh, for example, the cruising, which is the practice uh, of uh, having sex relationships among strangers, in public spaces, usually related to nature, uh, and that they are considered outside the norm, and that calls into question the most defin common definitions of common nature. Uh, the Matadero Madrid Cultural Center, and then we can see the Scarabox <laughs> by Andres, <laughs> is located in the heart of an urban um, heat island due to the lack of uh, shadow and the lack of green spaces, so it suffers more of the uh, warm temperatures. So the proposal, and then you, there you see the model there, uh, is to implement architectural solutions based on nature in order to mitigate the effects, uh, the heat island effect, and at the same time rethink uh, the role of the public space from a queer point of view. So what we built uh, in Matadero was this prototype of what uh, we could bring to this, uh, this space in order to mitigate the, climate change, the effects of the climate change. So this uh, garden for romantic crossovers would link humans, uh, vegetation and technology in an infrastructural garden of post-natural coexistence. Um, a set of technologies imported from the agricultural industry uh, generate this optimum environment conditions for these hanging gardens that mix aphrodisiac and aromatic species uh, that will simulate the relationship between humans and other species. Uh, so uh, you see there UV bulbs, thermal bulbs, uh, irrigation systems, uh, shadowing textiles, are some of the elements that take part on this lightweight structure uh, and public furniture device. The next project is Solstice. Uh, with Solstice, we, uh, we wanted to explore uh, from which conceptual frameworks uh, usually uh, we start formalizing architecture no? and uh, put them into crisis uh, through the adoption of other materials and aesthetic criteria. So uh, if we agree that the planet is a material production, the result of human actions and uh, the proliferation of concepts such as Anthropocene um, are a clear example of that. Um, we also agree that these uh, debates, uh, uh, modern uh, uh, binomies uh, like uh, nature and culture and human, non-human and woman and men uh, are also uh, like uh, over. So, uh, in this sense, we tried to start to develop this project from the assembly of the multiplicity of a multiplicity of materials that would come from very different origins. So, uh, you see here uh, from like uh, uh, flowers and stones and branches picked up from the site where we built the pavilion to plastics and cardboards and uh, some other. Uh, typologies of material that we also, even garbage that we picked uh, uh, around the area. 
and like that we we build this uh, dome uh, that was supported by this uh, wooden structure made with a CNC machine uh, this golden dome that in inside there was this uh, foam ceiling and uh, from uh, the interior and exterior you could see these uh, 16 capitals and this curtain mm, made of woven nylon threads in order to prevent the wind from uh, getting inside. Uh, then uh, this is um, in transit shelter for migrant species. Um, uh, the, the figure of the climate refugee, which we are starting to get used to uh, listening to this uh, political um, uh, figure, is this person which is forced to migrate from their uh, uh, region of origins due to change on the local habitats caused by climate change. Um, we're getting more and more used to this, um, this um, concept, but uh, we uh, th there are also uh, the humans are not the only ones that uh, are uh, climate migrants. No? So in this project we wanted to show how the optimal conditions for other species are also affected uh, by the sudden changes in weather conditions due to climate change. No? So in this drawing you can see like uh, all these species that now are local from the north of Africa and the south of Spain that potentially will become um, local species in Barcelona. So within the framework of, of an exhibition where different urban models for the future of Barcelona were discussed, our project paid attention of those silent victims of our industrial development. So what we did was to, in, inside this room, uh, we artificially reproduced the future conditions as experts are um, uh, saying that uh, Barcelona in 2075 will have in terms of temperature, humidity, etc. And uh, then we uh, included this uh, shelter that hosted those plant species that will we predict that will be local at that time. No? Uh, so uh, again, this proposal uh, arises from uh, considering cities as spaces for interspecies co coexistence and therefore taking ecopolitics and environmental ethics in a se as central elements for the construction of our contemporary democracies. Finally, we also collaborated with a composer to develop specific music based on non-human comfort uh, requirements so that the visitor's experience was totally immersive. I don't know if the audio is going to work. Yeah. So because we very often import uh, technologies that they usually use in these greenhouses in the Netherlands, we learned that they also put music to the plants so to make them like um, uh, grow, f they stress them a little bit so to grow faster because they are feel comfortable with that. Uh, the plan of this uh, for this was that they com make, make them feel uh, better, not, not to grow faster. Um, next project that I wanted to show is uh, uh, Dome de Cohabitación, Dome, uh, uh, dome for uh, Cohabitation. Um, so uh, this was at the first biennial of feminist art and architecture in, in the for the FRAG Center in Orleans. It's the third collection of architecture after MoMA and Pompidou. And uh, we were asked to mm, take of, uh, all the artists uh, take over this uh, abandoned industrial space um, that uh, was supposed to be the next headquarters of this uh, FRAC museum. Um, so this was our ground zero, but the, our ground zero is never a tabula rasa. So uh, there was a multiplicity of uh, agents uh, that already uh, were established there. No, There was this soil, uh, there was rain inside, there were uh, insects, animals, uh, microorganisms, and, and a lot of vegetation there. So um, uh, we consider that as a starting point of the, um, the project, uh, all these uh, previous uh, members that, uh, that took over this site uh, should be taken into consideration whenever intervening the, the place. No? So um, I think, well, this is a, well, the, the move is not working also. Uh, no. Okay, so what we did was this mobile infrastructure that was floating above the ground, intensifying those relationships that had already spontaneously begun to occur 
uh, among this space and, and uh, stimulate it and, and making uh, growing uh, this ecosystem. No? So again, this whole set of mm, growing lights and uh, uh, thermal lights and fans and irrigation systems, uh, typical of the most sophisticated greenhouses, uh, we intended to explore the imaginary of a society based on cooperation instead of competition and on symbiosis instead of extractivism. This is a, a photo of the uh, um, of, of this at night. Then uh, cat shelter. Uh, Rome has this uh, very uh, special and adorable thing, which is the figure of the catara. So we were uh, called to work in Rome, and, and we learned that from the times of the Roman Empire, um, cats have been protected by law in Rome. They are the, uh, because their benefits as pest controllers and the mutual benefits uh, with humans, uh, uh, this law uh, apparently has like uh, overcome this uh, modern obsession with sterilizing public spaces, so they are still protected and they are the only ones allowed into the uh, monuments. Um, and into the ruins and so on. No? So, um, but the cats are uh, helped by ordinary but organized uh, citizens who feed them and look after them, which are the gatheras. So uh, if a colony of cats is detected in any place of the city, like meaning two cats, the city, the municipality is forced to um, preserve their habitat, not move them from there and still feed them. Of course, always with the help of these gatheras. So what we did was to, um, detect uh, or like the most common uh, colonies of cats in the city center of Rome. So, and we choose this Ignacio Salone um, near Ostia station uh, colony of cats and we, built the, we bring, brought this cat shelter there. So um, this project again in the public space speculated on the creation of a non-anthropocentric uh, architecture. So neither the materials nor the form nor the space were designed for human use. Um, Again, uh, the project, uh, this is our neighbor, Alfredo, uh, that was testing the prototype and telling us which worked and which not <laughs> while we were building it, uh, pointed <laughs> out uh, the emergency <coughs> of thinking about public space, not only prioritizing human needs, but also taking into account their species, the species that inhabit with us in the cities, and uh, reinforcing all kinds of mutualistic relationships. So you see, how we selected four and textures and colors and change based on the perspective, on the vision of, of the cats. No? Uh, Pink Mountains, uh, this is uh, the, the recent history of Spain has this uh, very special relationship with the Argentinian parrot. Uh, it was in the 80s and 70s and even 90s, uh, became very popular as a pet in Spain uh, and it was in every Spanish home. But as you can guess, the Argentinian parrot is not coming from Argentina. Uh, we imported thousands of these parrots uh, in Spain, and then we abandoned them. And then nowadays, these green parrots have become a plague in many cities of Spain. And uh, it, it, there is a quite a controversy on, on top of that. No? So uh, there are, uh, of course, ethical conflicts and then discrepancies between um, human rights, uh, like uh, animal rights defenders and ecologists and biologists. Uh, um, but uh, while that uh, municipalities have been carrying out the extermination of these populations uh, that are considered as invasive. So um, what we consider cu very curious is the, to analyze the causes of this supposed invasion um, and the reasons for the extermination, because far from being that this species uh, is like affecting the the um, the, the local ecosystems is purely because it's noisy and the nests are heavy and so on no? so we wanted to in this uh, um, pavilion that we built in the city of Barcelona we wa wanted to bring uh, to the discussion uh, uh, these questions also to the, um, the cu uh, cultural arena. So in these like uh, terras of the uh, Center for Arts of, of Santa Monica um, in Las Ramblas, which Las Ramblas is a very touristic uh, uh, space in the uh, city of uh, Barcelona, um, where more than 15 species of birds, including green parrots, uh, nests. We wanted to, uh, uh, we were asked to build this uh, climate shelter for the summer, uh, 
um, because of the temperatures that are, are so hard. Um, so uh, we wanted to uh, uh, project this uh, climate shelter where coexistence with birds, including the Argentina parrot, of course, would be most of the, uh, one of the most characteristic elements. No? So we uh, built this covering material with thousands of pink painted small branches um, um, and uh, uh, that were waiting for the birds to pick them up and build their uh, own nests. Uh, uh, the bird houses were only served uh, as like a visual claim, uh, while our dream was to start seeing the emergence of these uh, dozens of queer nests through the city uh, and helping the birds having some material to, to pick up and, and build their nests. Um, this is an image from La Ramblas of this, uh, of this pavilion that we recently finished. And uh, in the interior, we also wanted to work with this. Uh, we, we built this uh, tropical garden that also helped um, um, soften the temperatures and, and this perimetral birth, uh, bench in order to, to rest. And uh, to just to finish and very quickly, we I wanted to explain uh, two very recent projects with a radically different program, but that we also uh, try to um, have like this kind of similar approaches. No? So we call it domesticities in the new global climate regime. Uh, first uh, project that we wanted to show very briefly, it's the day after house. We're not going to show uh, all aspects of the project, but we just wanted to show with this slide uh, what our work methodology was uh, to develop the project. Uh, what we did was to analyze every single uh, space of the house and every program of the pro prototypical uh, middle class home in the Western cultures. And uh, uh, from kitchen spaces, the bathroom, the, mm, the uh, terraces, the uh, ways of heating and cooling, the corridors, um, in order to understand also the political reasons that had led to this particular configuration of houses that almost all, all of us, if we live in New York, uh, live in, in the same house. So uh, we're not going to go through all of these uh, studies that we did in order to, to do the house, but we will rescue just one of them. Uh, that is the, the habit of organizing the house into rooms and sleeping separately. So uh, following Silvia Federici's uh, and her feminist analysis of the birth of capitalism, we learned that gradually, uh, rooms began to become smaller and specialized in a space exclusively for sleeping. Uh, so what uh, Silvia Federici proposes is that the incipient capitalism increasingly needed stronger and more differentiated subjectivities. So uh, sleeping collectively didn't work, work, uh, help for that. And uh, that uh, would better adapt to m the multiple also possibilities that uh, the market uh, offered, no? that the industrial market offered, no? so uh, separate heatings and so on, um, which also uh, was reflected on the programmatic organizations of the domestic spaces. No? So if we look at this 16th century engraving uh, from uh, Giovanni Stradano, we see a very different way of inhabiting the rooms uh, that is totally different from now. No? Um, so we see how in the same room uh, people are working, but also sleeping, but also cooking, and uh, uh, living as a community, work, played, and sleep together in these pieces of furniture that uh, we call alcoba. No? So our project uh, had the um, intention uh, of, one of the intentions was not depending in any way of, of fossil fuels, uh, studied another way of configuring the space. So while you see on the left the regular home that had a distribution through corridors and bedrooms, uh, same plan that everybody lives here. Um, uh, the, uh, the project opted for an organization through nested spaces, as you see on the right, and now you see here, that retained the heat in the central park where there was the only bedroom in the house. So the red you see is the bedroom, orange is what we call the winter bed, uh, house, and the blue is the summer house. Well, we first thing that we did was to take out the windows. We love taking out the windows also. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> so that is why it's uh, blue, it's not heated. Um, so uh, the advantages of sleeping together are countless. They have energy saving reasons and also strengthen emotional ties. So what we propose in this project, uh, and the client accepted, is that they had, um, uh, to build uh, just one single communal bedroom 
regardless of the number of inhabitants of the house. So uh, I explain you this because we are uh, absolutely convinced that more than the use of sustainable materials or the incorporation of sophisticated technologies, a political approach to architecture is the only way to embrace truly ecological thinking. Uh, these are some images of the rest of the house. This is the summer bedroom uh, house without the windows, you see? <laughs> there. And the exterior, yeah. Uh, and these are some of the interior spaces. We see the communal bedroom and the, uh, the kitchen. And then you see the kitchen and the exterior bathroom. And then just finally, t um, I'll show you very briefly the 10K house. Um, w la this last project is very linked to the previous one. Um, and uh, what we did is to try to include the economic uh, factor into the ecological issues also, not to, uh, yeah, uh, to, to link ecology to uh, affordability. So what we want to see in this project is to what extent we could work by reducing the budget to the most and also dismantle the models uh, and aesthetics supposedly associated with homes of lowering economic va value. No? So to do so, the first thing to we did, and I'm not going to go through it, it, was to analyze the different materials of the previous house that you saw and to uh, subject them to, um, to an analysis uh, by three parameters uh, from the economy. Uh, like, uh, yeah, the incorporated carbon, the economy, and the aesthetic relevance. And out of that, uh, we build this uh, 10K manifesto that I will explain super briefly. 10K uh, is according to the budget that we have, the total budget that we have had to, to uh, renovate the house. No? So uh, first, uh, first point of the statement is to work with thermal gradients in order not to depend on fossil fuels or to heat or cool the house. So as, uh, as in the previous house, uh, we, we were trying to use our body temperatures and also like the different materials and the configuration of the spaces in order to uh, save uh, energy. And um, uh, next thing was to elevate the build elements of the house, allowing like that the free passages of installations so that we didn't have to do holes and uh, hire other experts and um, reducing times and uh, costs. No? Um, next one is the reduction of the material palette to the maximum. So basically we just like used one or two materials. Uh, so like uh, that uh, cost, energy efficiency and structural performance uh, could be kept as balanced as possible. Uh, another one was the elimination of new coatings, saving both in the purchase of new materials, execution in times and, and also in uh, carbon footprint. Um, and uh, another one was the hedonistic and playful vision of the bathroom and kitchen, that we moved them to the best spaces of the house uh, the, next to the facades. And uh, last one uh, was the self-construction. So uh, this uh, uh, renovation exclusively made through uh, dry assembly work, um, like uh, uh, IKEA uh, furniture, uh, um, was proposed, uh, and also uh, uh, and that allowed the incorporation of non-experts building the house that was us and the client basically that uh, build the complete uh, thing without having knowledge on other kinds of um, works and labors. Uh, something that we want just uh, one um, uh, just to last slide uh, to conclude, uh, tremendously satisfying for us was working with natural ship wool as a thermal installation for the bedroom. So there's this transhuman ship uh, of the Pyrenees uh, that uh, are moving and uh, their work are ve is very um, uh, uh, good for the for the for the uh, eco ecosystems, but their wool is not suitable for the um, for the fashion industry. So the their wool is discarded. But there is this some cooperatives in Catalonia that are um, recovering this wool in order to uh, use it as insulation. But that is usually you don't see them it, but we, we fell in love with the material and, and we used it. And just to conclude, I wanted to show um, a quote uh, by Paul Preciado um, that who reading Berrida uh, alerts us to the delusion behind uh, apparently sacred concepts such as nature 
and gives us clues on how to act to dismantle it. So the quote is, uh, the success of the performative does not depend on a transcendent power of language, but on the simple repetition of a social ritual that legitimized by power hides its historicity. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really very interesting, very rich, and there is indeed a lot of overlaps uh, that we have spotted. I'll start with the overlaps, perhaps. Uh, so I think that um, both the work of TAC and urban wild ecology invite us to entirely abandon the concept of nature. I think it was mentioned this, this maybe twice uh, tonight, uh, and not even once, I think, in the soil example. So we don't even think about nature, which is out there, which is passive, and we can control and master as architects, as knowledgeable um, mm, uh, kind of individuals, as subjects. Uh, but there was an invitation, I think, from the two practices to designers uh, to uh, think of other uh, ways of crafting the cohabitation of uh, humans and many other species. And we have seen such a, a rich range of species tonight. I have made a quick list. We have seen green parrots and cats, uh, uh, birds, the murtia birds, uh, uh, fungus, soil, uh, and insects that live in the soil. We have seen uh, sheep and uh, lots of different plants, right? Uh, and I can continue the list. So uh, your design, in a way, I, I think it's an interesting common feature in the two practices that you defy all sorts of anthropocentric, uh, anthropocentric kind of design and you try to rethink uh, the uh, kind of the oikos, that's another uh, term that was mentioned many times in different forms, house, dwelling, dome, shelter, and the different forms of um, dwelling and, and sharing uh, a space together. So you try to rethink dwelling and, and oikos by inviting all those species uh, to join. Uh, and uh, more, m more, most importantly, not just to join, uh, but by giving them voice by acknowledging their needs. And we have seen very careful consideration of the music and how birds react to music, of the impact of climate change on some of those species. So this awareness and care was there in the design. And this is amazing to see how those voices, voices of uh, species that we often do not hear and we do not acknowledge in design have been taken uh, very seriously uh, in uh, the designs that you uh, propose. I think it's also very interesting to see that we are perhaps on the side of TAC uh, talking about animal friendly um, or species friendly architecture because there were more than animals and then soil friendly type of architecture, uh, but it's actually much more than uh, what uh, that this kind of friend friendly type of design that you're doing, because you're trying to bring some symmetry between uh, humans and those uh, species, in and you try to craft a different kind of uh, way, different systems or different architectures uh, of cohabitation uh, with uh, uh, humans, which I think was quite uh, interesting to see. And with all this richness in all these projects, I think um, your work in a way demonstrates uh, to what extent um, designers and we as architects are in a very unique position to do things from within. to Not just to rethink and reimagine, but to actually craft this cohabitation of humans and other species to craft these ecologies very carefully and to craft them from within. And this is perhaps uh, the uh, kind of affirmation of tonight uh, that instead of critically kind of addressing climate change, biodiversity, and we can continue the list, uh, or uh, instead of addressing it in a discursive way or in a militant way going against, what we can do as designers is to work from within, is to craft new solutions, new resourceful solutions from uh, within. So in a way, the statement that all these interesting projects make together uh, is that architectural uh, design can become a powerful instrument for reimagining cohabitation, for rethinking this 
symmetry and for crafting new uh, solutions uh, uh, and uh, new ways of uh, cohabitation, also for rethinking the cosmopolitical order. We can also go into a kind of more ambitious direction. So my question is then, if this awareness is there, if the climatic awareness is there and the, the biodiversity <laughs> awareness is there in practice, how is this changing the entire a kind of ecosystem of practice, the techniques you use, the materials you pick, uh, the dynamics of practice, the ecology, the internal ecology of your practice as practitioners. Because if we think of materials, and uh, Jorge is the expert here, uh, but if 30 years ago it was possible just to pick a material from the shelf, yeah, uh, wood or glass <laughs> or just sand and use it, in architectural construction. Now this is not possible any longer because every material we can point to, nearly every material, is an object of contestation. It's controversial. There's, there's another kind of, uh, a kind of number of concerns that uh, uh, this uh, material opens or take asbestos or take uh, wood and then you find a whole controversy there. Uh, so it's just not possible to take one of those stable technical or material resources and use it in our practice. We also have to rethink the materials, the techniques, and the way we design. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this reflexivity, how biodiversity and climate change is also kind of making you rethink the techniques and the materials that you use in your work. I can go here. Yeah, like, uh, uh, thank you very much. I find it very interesting. Like the way I think um, uh, it's true, this like uh, uh, idea of how um, uh, each material is subjected to uh, controversy, no? so we very carefully have to pick up uh, the materials, the techniques, and everything that we, uh, um, that we have in our hands to do uh, architecture. Um, uh, it's true, like that. Uh, we, uh, when uh, when picking up ha materials and techniques and and assembling methods uh, of, uh, um, we uh, often even include more things to these uh, controversies. No, so mm. um, more than the traditional technological or scientific. Um, criteria to choose a material like uh, mm. there th that we of course also use it mainly for instance in our like uh, domestic spaces like for uh, the embedded carbon who uh, who built it uh, where does it come from how much uh, um, time uh, did it take uh, is it going to take to recover it like so uh, all these aspects that uh, we are uh, often used to uh, um, listen and that uh, maybe uh, we uh, when when embracing our domestic spaces we uh, uh, or how beautiful it is how it performs uh, in terms of insulation or how it uh, performs structurally or how functional it is how how is it um, how easy is, is it to clean it no uh, many of these mm. uh, things no like the wool was not very um, mm -hmm. Uh, useful for being seen, but we found it very important. Also, um, we also like uh, believe that, uh, as many many others know, that uh, uh, materials have uh, other things that cross them, no? like that uh, uh, mm -hmm. political issues that go through them, like uh, uh, political and um, and uh, and many other things. No, so. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the color. No, we were talking about the other day. We were talking, you and me, about uh, 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 sometimes uh, we uh, use certain materials or certain techniques, or w sometimes in the more speculative projects that are just uh, uh, there for a person that is going to visit a certain biennale for one or two uh, uh, 15 minutes, or uh, when uh, uh, projects when in public space, we often uh, choose uh, materials uh, with uh, other kind. Or when we were talking about solstice and we um, uh, were working with materials and techniques that uh, 
usually the modern movements has uh, has uh, bands or has uh, like uh, considered as minor works or considered mm. as not serious architecture and so on. Mm. We also uh, embrace these political agencies that material have in order to uh, resignify them and uh, uh, use mm. them uh, as in uh, yeah, trans feminist or queer uh, um, thinking uh, to use uh, these uh, materials or techniques uh, that were in some period uh, minorized or, co or uh, uh, assigned to oppressed uh, minorities uh, in mm. order to uh, mm. uh, turn them around. No? So, uh, mm. so the the complete uh, parameters that we um, embrace when choosing the materials and the techniques are countless and uh, also like specific for each project. No. Mm. It is very yeah difficult to judge uh, the material, what is good and what is bad. And the first that uh, we show the insulation of the floor is uh, uh, we use like a polystyrene board, uh, which we were consulted by like ecological architect. Mm -hmm. We should use it because it's high quality mm -hmm. and also we have we learned like uh, you have to prevent the humidity with plastic seat and it's of course reduce the energy like uh, for heating energy and also air conditioning energy but also like making this uh, have a lot of energy and uses a lot of energy also like it doesn't also goes back to the soil so it creates a lot of trashes so afterwards we started to use the um, you know, uh, biodegradable materials and the, we learned also from the carp traditional carpenter that uh, you shouldn't like pack the stru wooden structure with plastic seed because uh, it's kind of prevents the breath of the wood which also uh, uh, makes the wood last longer. So we have to kind of balance like uh, what we have chosen but like uh, since we have kind of recognition of the um, soil uh, environment importance we somehow tend to use the biodegradable materials because we know mm -hmm. that it goes back to our garden mm -hmm. so this is kind of um, yeah our tendency now like how we choose the yeah, materials and also mm. of course it can be wrong because like a new in information and new technology new knowledge is very faster comes but architect has to be adapt with this you know new and we shouldn't like uh, stick with in one so that's what i think and uh we always refer to, uh cradle to cradle the the book uh written by uh McDonald and Brongard. Uh, they said uh, there are two cycles. One is uh, biosphere cycles. Another one is technical s uh, technosphere. Is how to say it's artificial uh, cycles. So we uh, they said we don't uh, we must not uh, mix uh, each other because if we mix uh, biosphere and technosphere, it's uh, polluted pollute each other we uh, yeah we have to avoid this so but the w if we use uh, uh, artificial materials this is how to say it's uh, if we use uh, artificial materials and also we uh, at the same time, we have to create the recycle uh, uh, systems. Mm. This is also a uh, big issue. It's, uh, it's we so this recycle uh, system we we uh, don't we cannot design. So that's why we focus on the, the uh, natural uh, cycles. Mm basically yeah just building on the on the conversation what a what a wonderful set of uh, presentations i i really 
um, admire what, what you're trying to do. So I wanted just to ask you a quick question to, to maybe get you to talk to one another. Um, <laughs> in, in relationship to, you know, about your relationship to the ground in your, in your architecture, you know, the, both of you made some very specific claims about how your architecture relates to the ground, but also the architecture itself showed different relationships to the ground, very careful ways of both revealing the ground or, or, or lifting up the architecture from the ground. Or um, I think in both cases, you're both lifting up the architecture from the ground. Uh, at some point, you're leaving the architecture uh, in, uh, above the ground. And um, Maria, yeah, in your case, sometimes you're picking up the ground and literally putting it into, you know, taking it with you in the architecture uh, and, and encapsulating it in the architecture. Um, and so I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about your, your um you're thinking about in this contemporary moment how you, the, your architecture's relationship to the ground really enacts a kind of larger philosophy of um, of, of 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 what ground means for you. You know, it it, it doesn't necessarily. You know, I think you're both. If correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that. Both of you don't think of the ground as mere support f for the architecture to stand on. There's something else going on, but there's something very different going on in both of your projects in terms of the, in terms of the, the, the ground, the yeah, telluric. We see the ground like kind kind of hidden half of the nature. Do you know about the book about hidden, um, hidden half of the nature? There is a book about the like working of microorganism in the body and the on the ground is the same way and kind of supporting our lives. So the ground, we don't see what happening. Uh, um, so we don't really think, but the all the working of microorganisms and the water is generates the oxygen, our food. So it's, we have to treat like also like our, you know, air, uh, well, not polluted, and not heating up, but also like a ground is like equally important. So mm. that's why we try to do it. And it's not, we don't, we can't see. So if we don't reveal in our architecture, uh, we can't show. So this is somehow also what uh, lifting up is like uh, speaking out what ground needed. Mm -hmm. And the other one is like we, uh, as a human, we need some distance from the um, soil, in my opinion, because I think uh, we when we didn't have a window on our house, of course, cold air and uh, hot air coming up, but also cockroaches and the mosquito coming up. And this we suffered a lot of, especially <laughs> him. I don't know, like mosquito goes to pick him up, not me. So we were like covering all the, uh, our bed, only our bed in the net, like you did. <laughs> um, not the net, but you sheltered the bed. So um, somehow like we want to coexist. If they are in outside, it's okay. We can accept and we just uh, put spray <laughs> ourselves to prevent from the insect, but uh, not probably inside. We can mm -hmm. coexist. So this is also like somehow behavior that to coexist, we need some shelter to protect us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I admire very much your approach to to this, no? Like the, to find in Tokyo these these pieces of land, no? and uh, it's true that yeah, we we don't have like many examples on how working with the ground, I especially in this arca where we had to lift the ground. Wh what we really wanted to do is that because there's there's this like um, street Ronda San Antonio that it has like uh, sixty centimeters. Uh, concrete um, 
uh, street because of uh, there was this garden, uh, this market that was like um, on works and then they had to put it there so they had this. So we wanted to get into the ground but it was impossible because it's like uh, so high. So uh, yeah, we feel it's very important to come to the ground and that was also why when they asked us to intervene on the frag on this abandoned space that was like totally uh, took over by the by ground and by uh, and uh, and we saw that the the, the just the space uh, nearby was uh, already starting to get renovated. So first thing that they do is to totally sterilize and isolate, like as we learn in modern movement, like to isolate everything from the exterior. We said, okay, no, th this is not like. Uh, they want us to uh, bring a feminist approach to this. Uh, this is what we are exactly not going to do. Like to, um, to like, uh, uh, like uh, prevent the rain from coming in and uh, uh, and kill the the connection of the ground and the exterior. No? So, and that is something that is a little bit also uh, all of these like uh, um, obsession of modern movement or from uh, of isolating the human spaces from the exterior um is like only also leading us to unhealth and and to depend on fossil fuels no that is why also we took away the the windows in our mm -hmm. in our house no and and how we're also letting the cockroaches uh, <laughs> coming in no but like uh, um yeah we think no and and looking to examples of, of previous, like uh, we also very much look into the history of recent architecture, no? like uh, the house of Alex in, in Galicia in the north of Spain uh, is, was, uh, uh, it, it is very common uh, everywhere, no? but like it has um, on the ground floor the cows and then the living room is on top, but the, the, um, the floor is porous so that the heat of the cows is coming to to your to your home so uh, there is this mutualistic relationship the how the cow can heat your your space and you don't need external uh, fossil fuel based heating and you are uh, establishing al also interspecies relationships that um, no, uh, that were yeah. there always no? can I ask you a follow-up question so it, it seems that you know on the one hand soil uh, and ground has a uh, a kind of connotation of place and a, the thing that doesn't move in a kind of material ecology, right? It's the, it's the kind of, it's the Archimedean uh, leverage point. You know, everything else moves, but the ground stays. But it seems that you both have different attitudes towards, towards that sense that it may be uh, in your work, Mio, uh, at your, uh, well, you're both um, letting the ground stay and the architecture kind of circulate around it, but you're taking the ground with you. <laughs> you're the, the ground is part of the mobility of, of the material ecology. So, but both of you, I think, are, it seems to me, looking at ground as a material, as a kind of composite material, as, a, as, a, as, as not something other than architecture. Yeah. But, but, and so it leads me to my follow-up question about the nature of uh, temporality in, in your work, because it, it seems that both of you have a kind of uh, commitment to ephemerality. Um, you, 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 you mentioned this uh, uh, in your m and practice, um, the expired city. Uh, it's already, let's say, done. And, but we're not necessarily here. It seems, again, if, if I've misunderstood you, please correct me, that you're, you're not trying to um, uh, regenerate that city. There's something, uh, because that's a stable city. It's a kind of reference point. You're, you're working in Tokyo, you're working in Barcelona. These are big cities and your work is it, would it be right to say that it is committed to a kind of ephemerality of, of, um, of letting itself be taken away after a while, of, um, uh, of, of not being permanent, you know, um, is that, or, or, or are you, 
Yeah, I think it's kind of the architecture is a, a one state of the network of the materials. So like one state, but it also goes back to the soil and it becomes a waste for recycling. So the mat there is like idea of uh, architecture as a material bank. So if we understand the architecture or like building as a material bank, so building itself is like bank of the materials. It's of course, it's understanding of ephemerality because um, then also like if we use the wood as a structure, it's go back to the soil and it's one day it goes like decompose and it goes to the like production site. So it creates mm -hmm. the cycle. So like wood is also one state of the yeah, substance. <laughs> so I think uh, for if we understand like a circu circularity of the yeah, biological sphere, like architecture, we can understand it very ephemeral. Hmm. Yeah, like uh, I think it's uh, something that is like uh, very contemporary. Like nowadays, like you no know, many many people are embracing these kind of approaches, and um, that uh, yeah, of course, like uh, if you like if we speak in terms of like also commissions like uh, many of them have even like a temporary like a, it's, they are already ephemeral but we uh, try to give it like a more also ephemeral approach like for instance if we build with these branches that we expect that the, the birds are taking them away or sometimes we will with uh, natural flowers that the bees are interacting with them or even like when we build the houses, no, we 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 are doing this starting point, uh, waiting for some other things to come, no, so that we are there just like us. In this period of time, we don't want things to stay the same as as they are, but we want uh, the rest of the agents that are there to like keep on like um, working with these uh, issues, no, with these uh, things that we left. Yeah. yeah, I think this this qu this question of of exploration and the sort of temporal dimension is is crucial. In fact, something that o came up in in the cohort as well, C Cordell Canards was was just to mention basically asking that the sort of hybrid in between that that many of your works address if that could be extended to the sort of temporal dimension. So there's no the notion of of new and expired that binary doesn't hold anymore and somehow how collapses maybe this is a good moment to to open it up to the um, uh, to the audience so seeing if there are any questions from the in-house audience I see Ignacio yeah hi uh, well thank you so much for uh, amazing presentations and for your work it's uh, I'm a big fan of uh, all your practices uh, so I have a question about scale uh, because uh, uh, you all operate from small practices with like uh, traditionally uh, sm what we could consider small projects, but uh, you have uh, kind of uh, uh, the commitment, I understand, to operate at a planetary scale, like the kind of networks that you engage uh, are uh, of planetary uh, kind of dimension and uh, they don't have like the traditional idea of the client as a kind of singular uh, thing uh, that uh, kind of uh, is contained in a smaller scale. Uh, and I want to understand, how do you understand kind of the bridge between those two, uh, the small kind of uh, 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 manifestation of your projects and the bigger scale of uh, the impact or, or the bigger scale of the networks and entanglements in which they participate? Uh, do you understand your projects uh, uh, as manifesto to take uh, uh, Bart, uh, Bart Jan's uh, uh, proposition, like uh, kind of as a my representation of a new ethos uh, that you expect others to join you in? Uh, do you understand them as prototypes that could trigger new uh, regulations, new policies? Uh, how do you understand the, the relationship between kind of the, the small uh, intervention and the big uh, entanglements that uh, you want to engage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, um, I think uh, we like uh, we can not like uh, separate the like the two different kinds of works that we do. Like I think when whenever we uh, work uh, 
for um, cultural institutions or for uh, biennales, triennales, or uh, even in the public space, uh, we uh, yeah try to uh, in a way like uh, in this like yeah uh, short period of time that these people are going to go through the the uh, works that we are doing uh, to try to uh, open up discussions uh, like. Uh, to uh, turn them into spaces of reflection, uh, to bring um, uh, things that uh, maybe um, have not been brought to the discussion, no? in terms of like uh, of uh, architectural issues or other political issues. Always like uh, in political issues that um, that uh, surround us, no, in, in terms of yeah, uh, contemporary thinking, ecology, feminism, and so on, no. So. Um, Mm, that is wh where we want to operate and activate all these uh, networks of agents when we do these kind of uh, works and uh, uh, like that try to imagine like possible futures of uh, how to embrace these kind of situations no um, then when we I think when we work on on um, on housing no? uh, we uh, we yes have done the effort to like in and, and i haven't gone very deep into the houses but like uh, in many aspects uh, we were uh, more yet trying to build this kind of manifesto of some specific actions that we collectively collectively can do in terms of housing and of dwelling and really proposing that uh, not just by the in this like very technological understanding of ecology of uh, uh, limited to what the regulations of the cert official certificates uh, dictate, uh, we uh, must uh, uh, act, but um, from uh, many other aspects, like from the way that we live uh, uh, in architecture in general, not just in our houses, uh, we could also uh, mm, try to like uh, uh, activate uh, some other things. No, so I would say yeah, like uh, it's more like uh, yeah, uh, we try to work like in these two different scales uh, of activation in the more speculative uh, approaches and. Uh, in a more like kind of manifesto present uh, uh, ways of, of of trying to yeah to act. Yeah. So I think selection of material uh, defines the size of the building. For example, uh, we cannot build high rise building uh, um, with straw blocks, for example. So I think the material is very related to the uh, coexistence of uh, other species. So if we uh, consider uh, about the other sp uh, other species living, uh, we have to change the materials, and then we uh, change the size of the uh, building according to the material. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, maybe uh, a question. We're, we're already uh, run running late, but maybe just to to get a um, question from from the planetary cohort in as well. We received many excellent uh, questions, just like last week. And, and one notion uh, that that several people brought up, which I think in particular uh, is is important, which is the sort of relation between ecological thinking and indigenous knowledge and this is also tying us in a little bit um, to last week's um, uh, conversation with, with TJ, uh, TJ Demos Futurisms that also addressed uh, this and Lex's work um, um, of course as well. So, so basically um, uh, Ivana Mapo um, is, is asking um, in, in what way does this ancestral indigenous knowledge inform your ecological perspective and arch architectural practice? This is something um, uh, I was I wanted to, to put to the table here. Is there mm -hmm. is there um, an importance? Mm 
For um, can you say it again? So Sorry. Yes, in, in what way does, does indigenous knowledge, ancestral mm -hmm. knowledge um, inform your practice and particularly in relation to, to ecological thinking? Because you know, I'm, I'm rephrasing her question here because, and, and that's something that came up last week, um, mm -hmm. that before the imposition of colonial capitalism, there were indigenous cultures that have managed to survive for thousands of years without creating ecological damage um, so, mm. so she, she she brings that at the starting point and um, is curious if, mm. if your practice in any way is, is informed by by such knowledge yeah like um uh, i think like um without uh, being so romantic about the past about yeah, it so. um, we uh of course like uh, know that from a certain period of time, we have relayed on fossil fuel energies uh, all the climatization of our houses, regardless of the orientation or of uh, uh, like uh, stopping the ventilations and so on. No? So, um, no, like the the house, the, f the day after house that I showed, it was like the it it is a very typical block of uh, of dwellings in Madrid that like. Uh, it, it it operates like by doing like a double symmetry, no? So yeah, like one house has the living room to the north and another one to the south, regardless of the conditions and the insulation. There is no insulation, no? Like like because we rely everything on gas, no? So um, uh, so f for us, it's very useful to come to examples of the past, like of how there are passive methods and uh, active methods not relying on on fossil fuels. <laughs> Um, of heating and cooling our houses, or yeah, to like because be, before it, houses were not sterilized, no, and you were also showing how the ground, like there was no concrete on the ground right. before, and that was much more healthier, no. So um, uh, for us, it's important to um, also, uh, of course, not not saying like uh, yeah, romanticizing the past, but to also review all these examples, no? The one that I said about the about the cows and the and the living rooms, no? And 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 the moments where um, our houses were porous and the air could breathe, uh, could 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 pass by, no? And and there were not uh, these like uh, geopolitical and e economical interests, no? So the client of the day after house where we. <laughs> where we took away the heating, there is no heating, no cooling, he was complaining a lot. <laughs> but then when the the Ukraine war came and then the politicians in Spain were starting to say, you have to turn down the, the heating, then he was happy because he, he was the only one that he didn't need heating in order to be comfortable in, their, in his house. No? And other place that we haven't uh, uh, shown that we also live, we live uh, uh, similar to you, we also like have are uh, working with no heating. We have the summer bedroom and the winter bedroom, and we move from one to another one. And no, then also learning a lot from vernacular examples. No? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's uh, um, once we I got to know like a power of the mycelium. I really fascinated, and I made a bench of out of a mycelium. So it's like a. Um, composed by wood chip and uh, hemp and the mycelium intervened the, uh, the structure and after we exhibited this like my partner in of M&M &M, uh, she stored in her house in this bench uh, in London and the mouse mice came to eat <laughs> so um, yeah I think a new kind of it's biodegradable materials, but we got to know that it's very interesting uh, uh, for uh, mice. So, but <laughs> I think a traditional knowledge has all this experiments, experience, right? And uh, this, uh, for example, straw bale has to be, uh, straw bale is quite a new materials, but has to be covered with mud. It's also like preventing the like, insect to live inside. Also, wood, how to assemble is like stronger, is about a tradition which we kind of piled up for more than uh, 2000 years. And this is like a really valuable kind of knowledge 
um, comparing new materials which we need to kind of examine all the um, affection using this in real. So of course it's very important and interesting to invent new materials, but I think we, it's very hard to compete to the um, yeah, traditional knowledge which is kind of uh, accumulated for 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years. I think we're out of time. Um, is, there, is there another audience question? There, Val? In the, oh. Or maybe we can combine two? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'll just ask and then we yeah. can pass the microphone. Um, when you speak of indigenous or traditional knowledge, there's still this sense of distance from this body of knowledge in the sense that we do live in a context where most people don't actually bear or operate with such knowledge. And I'm curious in that there, it, it's implied that there is this process of, I don't want to say evangelizing or convincing, but let's say, you know, bringing people into this. So my question to, to both, uh, uh, to, well, to all of you, is maybe starting with uh, Mio and, and Fuminori, how was the process of convincing your neighbors to adopt this soil alley? And, and similarly for, for Mireya, if you were to revisit these, these provocations, particularly in the pavilions, um, how, how, is, how do you think the next reception would be when not within a biennale, with, when not within uh, such a context? You want to? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we have too many microphones, so we have to run around. Hello. Um, to add that as well, the kind of society of undoing is a, is a nice, interesting thought in this process. Maybe to kind of add to the last question, there's this sense of undoing, kind of this human hierarchies in both of the work. In a sense, it's interesting because. I, when we were reading these kind of uh, papers, we were kind of viewing as, yes, you're undoing this, the human part of the society, but it's weird to do it as a human in, in that, isn't there still kind of that center of an Anthropocene in both of these projects still? I think when looking at that, I don't want to view it as more of a critique, rather a, a position of, of kind of progression, that both of these projects are still considering an, uh, more animals and different types of species that I'm wondering, um, to develop a new model society, what decides the metrics that influence a multi-species justice of place building? What is your sort of progressive mentality when you're looking at these projects? Um, what is, you know, the thing you're learning out of each time you make these uh, interventions? You want to start? <laughs> no, I <laughs> No, no, you yeah. said. Uh, ah, right. oh, right. <laughs> so, um, answer to. I, I didn't understand the, your yeah. question. Sorry. So, please uh, make it easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see. Me too. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, I guess the, the one I had written down was um, how do you measure this kind of how do you measure your multi-species justice? How do you sort of view every, mm -hmm. like, progression in each of your work? Mm -hmm. What is considered to be sort of building towards um, uh, justice, towards a marriage between plants and people? Um, um, so you mean, like, uh, how, to, uh, how, how to measure when we design? Or how to decide when we design, like, the balance between human and animal species. I think it's what, what are the sort of yeah. steps in between, right? The different skills yeah. to, to, to get to, to this sort of multi-inter-species or trans-species justice, like to, to, to get to this relationship, the, the sort of skills that are needed for that and, and the transition to get to those relationships, right? Is that how I understand it? Yeah. Is that 
how, <laughs> or how do we measure like the success or no? How how do we measure the? He's my student. I understand. He's our students. He was our student. Ah, he told me. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we measure the success or not success of the of the of of our interventions? I think it's very difficult because the the, the I we we are yeah, human can't uh, hear the, the species voices so we have to always uh, think uh, searching the s very scientific f uh, way for example we always learn from uh, uh microorganisms uh activate uh, yeah activity uh through the the uh scientific uh uh nothing you know the information for example the, the uh どう上学ってなってる。いや、ちょ。うん。なんて。まあいいや。どう上手ない。どう上の学会。うん。やつちの。うん。学者みたいな人の。ああ、その知識を得る。そう。いや、getting <笑><笑> Of course, like a gardener knows more, and of course not uh, also like a, a scientist knows more. But I think, of course, I don't know him, but personally, we don't design for microorganisms. We know that if they work, we are comfortable and they can live. Yeah, and through this, you know, I I think. It, other way of kind of designing for animals and multi species it's um i don't know it's more it's yeah since we don't know how they feel we it's very difficult but we can uh kind of uh, be objective like uh, observing their comportment of uh, kind of uh, how they come or their bird nest you design if never came <laughs> Uh, it doesn't work so we can also like uh, experimentally develop our knowledge as an architect too but uh, mm -hmm. also yeah. yeah sometimes it's like um like uh sometimes uh it's uh, times are so small that sometimes I even you cannot like test if it works or not no like uh, or or how how much interaction with the other species did you have or not no uh, usually it does, no? So uh, I can say, for instance, that the cat uh, shelter, like the rams, were useless. They never used them, and these kind of things uh, we can test, no? But like I think the goal is also to try to incorporate to the discussion of ecology these other uh, issues, no? So uh, uh, and that is also a success, no? The fact that the municipality of Barcelona has taken into consideration to include pieces, uh, species that are edible, not just species that the the um, the uh, uh, leaves are not going to fall in the winter, or they don't have to uh, sweep it, or they are uh, people cannot be allergic, no? Which are the param the criteria where they uh, are choosing the plants, no? So. Um, uh, also, like uh, we measure not just on how the other species behave, because the other species, I think, that is successful for all of them, because we are including them on the on the conversation. We are not like uh, uh, destroying their ecosystems. It is also like to try to open these discussions on the uh, on the citizenship uh, arena. No? 
I think now we're really out of time. <laughs> we, we, should, we, should, we should conclude here, but we can have these conversations through the next series of affirmation, the next iterations, I should mm. say. Um, yeah, but I, I, yeah, we can talk to you later. We'll continue to come. you're here. Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do that, <laughs> that here. And yeah. I just want to say to everyone, in two weeks, we'll have our next affirmation with Christopher Hawthorne and uh, Vicky Bean will be joining us here with um, Adam Lubinsky and Wei Ping Wu. Um, so that's it for now, and I hope to see you next time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you.